Are you an independent or a corporate podcaster? Thank you for joining me for the Audacity to Podcast. I'm Daniel J. Lewis. Who has the final say for your podcast? I think that is at the core of what's different between independent and corporate podcasters. This is the second episode in a mini-series that I'm doing to explore the different labels used to describe podcasters. And whichever label applies most to you, I do encourage you to own your label with pride and use that label to make better decisions about your podcast. If you'd like to follow along with the notes for this episode, then go to theaudacitytopodcast.com slash labeling two, that's the number two, or tap or swipe inside of your app to access the show notes there. And as an aside, before I jump into this, I never liked the term procasters, which you may have heard describing those top podcasters that are from the major companies and corporations like NPR and the different radio stations. The reason I didn't like that term is because it seemed demeaning to the indie podcasters. It made it sound like independent podcasters could not be professionals at what they do. And I think that's absolutely not the case. In the previous episode, I talked about hobbyist versus professional as labels for podcasters. And independent versus corporate had nothing whatsoever to do with the professional level. Independents can still be professional in their podcasting. So I prefer to use this label corporate podcasters to describe the podcasts that come from the major well, corporations, the major broadcast studios, even many of these celebrities who have some kind of sort of corporation behind them or a corporate style in their podcasting, I would describe those as corporate podcasters. So before I get into how these two labels, independent and corporate podcasters, are different, how are they the same or similar? Independent podcasters and corporate podcasters share the same similarities I shared in my previous episode about hobbyist versus professional podcasters. You can go back to listen to that episode for more details, but here's that list for convenience. Both can have excellence, both can have passion, both can have audiences of any size, and both can profit, P-R-O-F-I-T, popularity, relationships, opportunities, fun, income, and tangibles. I think how these things apply can be a bit different between independent and corporate podcasters, but I think they do still pretty much apply to both labels of podcasters. So what sets these two types of podcasters apart? First, what are indie podcasters? And you'll hear me use the term independent and indie interchangeably throughout this episode and in all kinds of other contexts. Number one, indie podcasters make their own decisions. I think this is the most important, most different point of everything else. This is really what it comes down to that separates the indies from the corporates. You could say the buck stops here for an indie podcaster. They make their own decisions, big and small. They might involve their co-hosts, their community, or other collaborators like an editor or a designer. But really, everything about their podcast is their own to choose. They're not subject to overlords of any sort. They don't have to answer to corporate sponsors. Yes, there is some accountability to sponsors if an indie podcaster has a sponsor. But that doesn't control what their content can be about. They can make their own decisions. Number two, indie podcasters are agile. In the web design world, for a while, it seemed like the new buzzword was agile development. And it implies that things can be changed very quickly and rapidly. And that does apply for podcasters too, having that agility. Because indie podcasters, can on a whim change their technology. They could launch a donation system or a membership site. They could create a new product. They could redesign their branding and much more. There's no approval process. And usually the only delays for an indie podcaster are in how much time it takes to implement any kind of change or decision or how long it takes for that delivery truck to arrive with that new piece of gear. Number three, indie podcasters made the podcasting industry. Don't let anyone mislead you here. NPR, Hollywood, major broadcast studios did not invent podcasting. Yes, they did help in other areas of podcasting for sure, and I'll get into that later. But podcasting was actually invented by independent people, namely Dave Weiner, who created RSS, 
and then implemented the technology to make podcasting possible with RSS. And those implementation suggestions came from Adam Curry, who co-created podcasting. And the whole foundations of podcasting are very independent. They're very pirate radio. It was even called that for a little while and in some contexts. And even still today, many people look at it as pirate radio, that you can do your own thing, maybe, as if pirates ever sounded like that. Number four, indie podcasters are resourceful. Independent podcasters are used to working with what they have or very limited resources. They're well acquainted with recording in a closet or under a blanket. And even when I first started my podcast, I was using a super cheap microphone and pantyhose for a pop filter. Acquiring that pantyhose was very awkward, especially since I was a bachelor at that time. That's a story for a different day. But indie podcasters are used to hacking things together to meet their needs. They're very resourceful. Sometimes that's because of dictations with their budget or what they're willing to do or interested in doing. I see some indie podcasters who will do things simply because they want to do it themselves. It's very DIY in the indie realm. Other podcasters might purchase something instead of building it themselves. But I think that most indie podcasters are very resourceful. Number five, indie podcasters are the majority. Of the nearly 1.1 million podcasts in Apple Podcasts at this time, I estimate there are only a couple or a few thousand podcasts, certainly under 1% of the total, that are hosted by corporate podcasters. The rest of the podcasts are the indies. It's the podcast by the mom recording when her kids are napping, by the dad who records maybe during his lunch break at work. It's from the teenager recording in their school classroom. It's from these people with these amazing ideas and the passion to share those ideas with the world. Those are the majority of podcasts out there. 1% of 1 million is 10,000. I really don't think there are more than 10,000 corporate podcasts out there. Certainly not active anymore. And when you look at the space that almost 50% of the podcasts have published an episode in the last 90 days, and that's gone up significantly because of a bunch of new podcast launches, still the independent podcasters dominate the industry. They are the majority. Most likely you listening right now are an indie podcaster. You are in the majority of podcasters. Number six, indie podcasters reach the niches. There's almost no niche too small. And for the British in the audience, niche. You can find a podcast on almost anything and usually hosted by people passionate about and highly experienced in those topics. Even if that's a small topic, there can be podcasts out there. And these are things that the corporate podcasters won't even touch because it's too niche. But indie podcasters do reach those niches. Number seven, indie podcasters want and deserve to be involved in the podcasting industry. I don't mean simply being in the podcasting industry by having a podcast, but I mean being involved, having a voice for the directions the podcasting industry goes. This is one of the reasons why I have big hopes for the new Podcast Academy, as long as they do represent the majority of podcasters, the independent voices in the Podcast Academy, and why I would encourage you to look at being involved in that, joining that, paying your membership dues to be part of the Podcast Academy so that you can be involved in the podcasting industry. Now, how much the Podcast Academy or any other organization like it actually influences the podcasting industry is yet to be seen. But I do think that no matter the direction the industry goes, no one cares more about the podcasting industry than the independent podcasters. So get involved in those things and don't downplay them. Don't say, oh, it's just a bunch of corporates. Well, it could be a bunch of corporates if you don't get involved. Sometimes it seems like podcasting is even a way of life to an indie podcaster. We wear it on our shirts, maybe even get tattoos of it. We talk about it. We ask each other, oh, what's your podcast about? We eat up podcasts. It does really become a way of life for the indies, not so much for the corporates. So these are seven things that I think 
set independent podcasters apart. Number one, indie podcasters make their own decisions. Number two, they are agile. Number three, they made the podcasting industry. Number four, they're resourceful. Number five, they're the majority. Number six, they reach the niches. And number seven, indie podcasters want and deserve to be involved in the podcasting industry. So what are corporate podcasters? Again, please try to avoid using the term professional or procasters or anything like that, because I want you to know you can be professional. You can be a procaster, even as an independent podcaster. Being professional at what you do is not a bad thing, and neither really is approaching it with a corporate mindset. It's simply different. So how is that different? Number one, corporate podcasters are subject to external oversight. Design by committee is a phrase that would always make me cringe and probably makes many other designers cringe out there because it's this idea that something ends up being worse because there are so many voices sharing opinions on something and saying, yes, you can do this. No, you can't do this. I think it should be like that. No, it shouldn't be like that. Well, so-and-so is a major sponsor of our organization, so we need to make sure that we bow to their wishes. Or so-and-so is the top executive here, so we need to do whatever they say. Now, there's a balance to all of that. I'm not saying that a committee is bad. What's bad is when a committee made up of people with no relevant experience to that thing directing where that thing goes. I don't see that so much, that design by committee mentality in the corporate broadcasting and corporate podcasting space, but corporate podcasters do have committees. They have executives and corporate interests, sponsors, and even legal regulations that often dictate what they can and can't do in their podcasts. So this being the number one thing that sets independence apart from corporate podcasters. Remember, for independence, they make their own decisions about their content, about their podcast, about their branding, about almost anything related to their podcast. They may share those decisions, especially in the case of being part of a network, but indie podcasters still are the ultimate decision makers, the ultimate authority over their own podcasts. That's not so much the case for corporate podcasters because they have the committees, the executives, the presidents, the donors, the sponsors, the legal obligations, and all of this other stuff. That's not bad. It's simply different. And one of the ways that it affects how they podcast is number two difference. Corporate podcasters move slowly and deliberately. That oversight in corporate podcasting does slow things down, but that doesn't make things worse. Not always, anyway. Most of the time, it actually makes things better because that slow and intentional movement often comes from a result of investing heavily, producing things heavily, researching things heavily, getting extremely skilled people to work in that podcast and do their part that they do best. So everyone is doing what they do best and contributing to this big overall podcast and the success that comes with that. And I think that's why the corporate podcasts so often launch with this big splash and they find great success because they've invested so intentionally and invested so well into what they do that they come out with something that's much better than what an indie podcaster can do. If that indie podcaster is simply one person or one person with a few others working with them or for them, an indie person couldn't have built the Eiffel Tower. It took a lot of people to build it. But an indie can still make something great, can still make art, can still make something that delights people, that serves purposes, and corporate podcasters can too. It's a different approach and different things around the podcast. Number three, corporate podcasters brought the podcasting industry mainstream. Now, they didn't create the industry, but Let's be honest, podcasts would not be anywhere near as popular as they are now if it wasn't for corporate podcasters. They brought and they continue to bring mainstream attention and large audiences to podcasts. That's a good thing. You hear the phrase, a rising tide raises all boats. And that is really true in podcasting because what we need for podcasts and the podcasting industry to grow is more people listening to podcasts. Now we have over 1 million podcasts. And a good question to ask as we see 
the number of podcasts significantly increase exponentially in the last few months is whether the audience is growing with it. And I, as an independent podcaster, cannot wield an audience of millions. There's no way I could do that. I'm not a celebrity, even though I share the name with a celebrity and sometimes get confused with him. Ha, some of the comments I've seen on my websites are hilarious where people actually think I'm Daniel Day-Lewis. But the celebrities can bring those big audiences. These corporations can bring those big audiences. The radio shows that become podcasts are helping us. Even though, yes, they tend to dominate the charts and get a bunch of attention in the podcasting space, that's just what's always going to happen. The corporate people get the big attention. The celebrities are celebrities, and they get the celebrity status that comes with being a celebrity. They get that attention. Yes, you can have breakout successes, and you as an independent podcaster can also have success regardless of celebrity status, because success can mean something completely different to you than to a corporate podcaster. But we do owe a lot of thanks to corporate podcasters for bringing in so many people to podcasting. And it wasn't necessarily serial either. As Tom Webster from Edison Research often points out in his Infinite Dial Share of Ear and Podcast Consumer Studies, the increase in podcast consumption and knowledge is often not pinpointed to a single success like Serial or something else. Serial was consumed by a lot of people who already listened to podcasts. Now, it did bring some new people for sure, and it did get some mainstream attention, but it's a lot of these individual corporate podcasters launching new shows, bringing new attention to the space. That is what's really helping the industry grow. And as this new wave of potential listeners comes into podcasting, we can help them find content they might enjoy even more. The niche content that's just as high of quality as the corporate stuff, but it's a much more refined and focused niche. Moving on to number four, corporate podcasters have powerful leverage. Because of the much larger audiences and bigger relationships that corporate podcasters have, they can move things in much bigger ways than you or I could. They can bring millions of people to podcasts. They can negotiate major sponsorships with these huge companies that would never talk to us. There was once a time that I approached Dr. Pepper because I used to play video games with the marketing director of Dr. Pepper. So I once approached him and suggested that he sponsor my clean comedy podcast that averaged maybe a couple hundred downloads per episode at that time. It wasn't worth it to them. But Dr. Pepper has sponsored podcasts since then, and that's exciting to see. And it's much bigger podcasts. And you're going to see other major brands come to podcasting, either through sponsorship or even through unique content that they create around their culture or for their audience. And that's all really good stuff. And that kind of leverage is what corporate podcasters can wield. And I think that it's more than just these companies and podcasts, but also they can inspire majority actions in the audience. A corporate podcast, because they're reaching so many more people, can share that message with so many more people. So they get a lot more leverage with that. Number five, corporate podcasters are the popular minority. Yes, corporate podcasters often dominate the charts. They steal a lot of attention and publicity. Not even really steal, they just get it. And there's often a bubble around the corporate podcasting space where that's all that people know. There's a particular podcasting newsletter that seems to never even acknowledge the 99% of podcasts out there. They didn't even acknowledge when podcasting hit the 1 million milestone in Apple Podcasts. Not a word about it, at least in their public coverage. And that's just what's going to happen because many of these people live in this corporate podcasting bubble or this mainstream bubble. And that's okay as long as they own that and they don't claim to represent the entire industry. But this kind of domination, this that's even not the best word for it, but it's a descriptive word, this power that comes, this popularity that comes with being a corporate podcaster is a benefit of having so much of that powerful leverage, those relationships, that audience. A corporate podcaster that has an audience of millions of people listening to their broadcasts or watching their shows 
whether that's on television, on YouTube, on the radio, in podcasts, or anywhere else, then because they have so much leverage, they can launch something new and a whole bunch of people flock to that new thing. A whole bunch of coverage gets focused on that new thing. They have all of these relationships. But remember, they are actually in the minority. Yes, they may have the majority of the audience, but they are the minority of podcasts. When you compare it to that bigger world of podcasts, I really think that the corporate podcasters are around or fewer than 1% of the total number of podcasts. And that could change in the future. And that's merely an estimate. I could be wrong on that, but I think it's somewhere around there. Number six, corporate podcasters reach the broad masses. Big podcasters literally can't afford to go super niche, but independent people can. But what the corporate broadcasters and podcasters do, they often do really well, and that's to appeal to a broader audience. And their experience, their connections, their skills, their staff, the resources they have to wield all help them to achieve and reach that broader audience and to do it really well. So you're not going to see a corporate podcast about a very niche topic. You'll see an indie podcast about that. And that indie podcaster could make their living from a small audience in that small niche. But the corporate podcasters won't even touch that niche because they can't afford it. It might cost them tens of thousands of dollars to produce one episode of their podcast. Whereas for the indie podcasters, it might cost a dollar, a few dollars, $50, depends on what kind of expenses you have with your podcast, where you're investing and what you're purchasing for your podcast. And even when a corporate podcast goes niche, such as hosting a podcast about their own product or their own TV show or something like that, it is still intended for the larger audience. They're making that kind of thing because they know their product has a large audience and they want to make something about that product because they can also wield their really large audience to promote that podcast about their own thing. This is why the official podcast for a TV show almost always dominate the charts compared to the independent podcasts about a TV show. Like for Once Upon a Time, for only two seasons out of seven seasons, there was an official Once Upon a Time podcast. I think they even skipped the first season of the TV show. But that podcast dominated the charts. They had fewer ratings and reviews than we did. Their episodes were shorter. Their episodes are, were worse. <laughs> I've talked about the problems that I saw with their official podcast. But the indie podcasters could really own the space because they could go into the niches and approach things in a niche way, even though that meant smaller audiences. But corporate podcasters reach the broad masses. And number seven, while I said that indie podcasters want and deserve to be involved in the podcasting industry, corporate podcasters use the podcasting industry. I believe corporate podcasters see podcasting as simply another tool to reach new audiences, grow their empires, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. You can use podcasting for that, whether you're an independent or a corporate. But the investments they make and the changes they want in podcasting are usually motivated by those more corporate interests. For example, an indie podcaster might want things to be easier, might want to reach their audience more easily, might want to record their podcast more easily, might want things to be cheaper. And by cheaper, we could be talking about $4 a month instead of $5 a month. But a corporate podcaster might want more data on their audience. They want to know more about are the ads being heard or seen by our audience members? And what are our audience members even like? Are they interested in these topics? What other websites do they visit? What other podcasts do they subscribe to? And so on. Those are more corporate interests. Yes, we can certainly benefit from that as independent podcasters, even though there are privacy concerns with all of that. And we're, I think, seeing more of a war between the corporate podcasters wanting more data and new privacy laws and regulations coming in place that would prevent more data from being provided. As much as I like more data, I also like privacy. And it's a constant balance. So these seven things that I think define corporate podcasters are, number one, corporate podcasters are subject to external oversight. Number two, they move slowly and deliberately. Number three, they brought the podcasting industry mainstream. Number four, they have powerful leverage. Number five, they are the popular minority. Number six, 
they reach the broad masses. And number seven, corporate podcasters use the podcasting industry. So what do you think of these labels? How else would you define independent versus corporate podcasters? If you'd like to share your thoughts, then please go to theaudacitytopodcast.com slash labeling two. That's the number two, theaudacitytopodcast.com slash labeling two. Before I wrap up this episode, something important I want to communicate carefully here. Don't make this an us versus them battle. Although it seems like corporate podcasters ignore and even metaphorically spit on the foundations that indies have built, I think the indies can learn a lot from the corporates. Also, I'd like to see more corporate podcasters and broadcasters recognize and take advantage of the niche and highly skilled experience of indie podcasters. One initiative that I attempted to start in the Cincinnati area and just had to move on to other things in life was to help local broadcast stations connect with their local podcasters to use as subject experts. After all, podcasters have the gear and they usually have the communication skills that broadcasters want. And they have the niches and the local connections. So instead of thinking that you as an indie podcaster are in a battle against the corporate podcasters, look for ways that you can work together to be involved together side by side. Yes, they might have an audience that is literally a million times larger than yours, but you can still learn from each other and still be involved together to help the podcasting industry grow and to help reach an audience out there with the messages that they want and need. So please don't make this an us versus them kind of thing. When I put the verses in the title of this episode, it's really only about how these terms are defined. This is not a battle. We are not out to try and conquer the corporate podcasters. And I don't think we should try and silo things where all the corporate podcasters get their own podcast apps and directories while the independents get to stay in Apple Podcasts or anything like that. I think what's incredible is that in this podcasting space, the indie podcasters have just as much opportunity to be featured, to have success, to reach an audience as the corporate podcasters. You look inside of the top charts in Apple Podcasts, and yes, you do often see corporate podcasts dominate those charts. And that's often just the nature of the leverage that they can wield for their new things, the investments that they can make, the press coverage that they can leverage. But you look at those charts and look at them closely, and you often see the little independent, essentially nobody, or at least nobody anyone knew about, right up there with the corporate broadcasters, reaching massive audiences and having great success with their podcast and success as they define it, and maybe having a lot of fun along the way too. So this isn't us versus them. Yes, they get a lot of attention. Yes, sometimes it seems like they demean the independent podcasters or feel like podcasting is their birthright. Don't believe that stuff and don't let that distract you. Seek to collaborate with them, to work together and to learn from them, even if they're not willing to learn from us or to acknowledge our existence, we can still learn things from them, how they're doing things well, and even what they're doing poorly or things that they can't do, like reach the niches and you can dominate the niches. So if this episode resonated with you, if you'd like to add to this conversation, please go to the show notes to comment there at the audacity to podcast.com slash labeling two. And before I go, you might want to check out mypodcastreviews.com. We just launched a new feature that now all podcasts update daily over there. So if you're that indie podcaster or a corporate podcaster and you want to see what people are saying about your podcast in the podcast apps like Apple Podcasts with its 175 countries, Castbox, Stitcher, Podchaser, and more coming in the future, then go over to mypodcastreviews.com and you can now get your reviews daily for whatever plan you sign up on, mypodcastreviews.com. Now that I've given you some of the guts and taught you some of the tools, it's time for you to start and grow your own podcast for passion or profit, whether you're an independent podcaster or a corporate podcaster. I'm Daniel J. Lewis from the audacity to podcast.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you.